If you've stepped into Destiny 2's endgame, you've probably heard of or maybe even gotten into debates over whether damage options like Thunderlord or Retrofit Escapade are worth using. While experienced players tend to understand what's worth using for damage, there's been a distinct lack of tangible, reliable data to go off of when it comes to comparing optimal damage strategies in this game. This is one of many factors that inspired me into making this series, and one that I'll finally be able to put to rest today. We've spent the first half of this series talking about a lot of theoretical concepts from when to do damage, to how to structure your damage, to what you should do damage with. Now it's time to get serious. Parts 5, 6, and 7 of this video series deal with real data, sourced from the most comprehensive damage testing ever done in Destiny 2. While parts 1 through 4 acted as a nice introduction to damage for newer players and a refresher for older players, no matter what level of experience you have in Destiny 2, these last three videos will contain a huge amount of new information about damage in Destiny 2. Many people watching this video have probably heard of a damage rotation before, or maybe even understand how to do a basic Izanagi's Burden swap combo, especially thanks to in-game events like Contest Vow the Disciple, where everyone and their mother was using a Palmyra B alongside the iconic Exotic Sniper. While damage rotations are not what they used to be pre-Quick Swap nerf, they are still nearly necessary to squeeze out as much damage as you can whenever you are damaging any boss in Destiny 2. One more thing before we get started, this would not have been possible without my testing team, so thank you to all of you who held the relic and blocked teleports while I shot an oversized Hydra for a week straight. Without you, I would not have been able to complete this project, and you can proudly say that you were part of the most comprehensive DPS testing ever done in Destiny, at least so far. And with that, let's get underway with Part 5, Damage Rotations. Let's start by defining what a damage rotation actually is. Last video, we talked about individual components and weapons that are considered meta in Season of the Deep, but rarely are these weapons used individually for one reason or another. Damage rotations, for the purposes of this video, refer to any damage strategy where you are not simply holding your fire button, using a single weapon the entire phase, maybe outside of tossing a damage super into the boss at the start of the phase. These rotations can range from simply sticking a boss with Wither Horde every once in a while, to using adds mid-damage to refresh buffs while also managing automatic reload cooldowns and ability lockouts. Now that we understand what damage rotations are, why use them? Let's look at an example. I mentioned earlier in the series that rockets are by far the most dominant DPS option in the game in Season 21. However, you may notice that firing a rocket by itself and manually reloading isn't very effective DPS, even with reload assistance from Lunafaction Boots and Loader Mods. Taking a look at D2 Foundry, we see that the base reload on Apex Predator is 3.18 seconds, scaling down to 2 seconds with triple loaders and Lunafaction Boots active. Why is this important? If you're clever, you may have also noticed that the firing delay for rockets is just above 1 second, at 1.1 for aggressive frames and 1.2 for adaptive frames. That means that no matter how much you increase your reload speed, there is no way to squeeze out the maximum DPS possible from a rocket by manually reloading. You might have noticed that doing so is much slower than using Clown Cartridge, Envious Assassin, or Reconstruction to shoot two rockets in a row. On top of that, even if you could reload an Apex Predator in a single second, during your reload, your character is doing nothing to damage the boss, resulting in damage loss. So what can we do to remedy this situation? Well, luckily for us, rockets fire incredibly quickly and do their damage in isolated spikes. This is actually half the reason rockets are better suited to optimal damage strategies compared to other options, the other half being Galahorn. Linears have charge time and machine guns require sustained fire, which disincentivizes swapping. On the other hand, the developers balanced rockets around manual reload times. From that angle, they don't look like such an outlier against linears and LMGs. However, the nature of a rocket means that you don't have to be interacting with it during its firing delay in order to have it do its optimal damage. You can do essentially whatever you want while you are waiting for your rocket to fire again, and you'll do equal or better damage compared to someone who is manually reloading. Couple this with the fact that all of today's meta rockets have automatic reload perks like auto-loading holster or reconstruction, or multi-shot mag perks like clown cartridge and envious assassin, and the long manual reload disadvantage of rockets is essentially completely nullified. So what should you do between rockets? During this firing delay, whether we're talking the second or so time between consecutive rocket shots, or between an automatic reload perk triggering, what can we do to fill the damage? In the previous video, we talked about the filler category of damage sources in Destiny 2, and this is where it comes into play. Ideally, we're looking for candidates that also automatically load themselves, have extremely high burst damage since we only need them for the brief period between rocket shots, and if possible, match the surges that we want to use with our rocket. Looking over the list of kinetic and energy weapons in Destiny 2, there are a few exotic standouts, namely Izanagi's Burden, the 4th Horseman, and Witherhorde. 
All three of these weapons can finish firing before, say, the 2.5 second reload delay of autoloading holster, which makes them ideal candidates for a rocket damage rotation. There are a few other exotics that do high damage, but they don't fit the bill of a damage rotation for a number of reasons. Agger Scepter prevents the use of a damage super and has the same disadvantages that a machine gun has. Arbalist simply doesn't do enough boss damage to warrant its charge time delay. Cloud Strike just barely misses the mark for doing enough damage to outdo Izanagi's burden, especially hindered by its 6 shot requirement for 2 lightning strikes, which do 129,000 damage, where Izanagi's burden, 116,000 damage for a honed edge times 4 shot, can reload cancel and add another weapon like a slug shotgun, which does 27,000 damage for an energy slug, into the rotation before the rocket reload window is over. Conditional Finality does a fair amount of damage, 107,000 across both shots, but has no automatic reload on top of losing damage if other sources of Shatter and Ignite are present in the team. Forerunner, about 150,000 per mag, does significant damage when assisted by Mechaneer's Trick Sleeves, but requires a critically wounded state, a lengthy mag dump, and the sacrifice of a better overall damage exotic like Radiant Dance Machines. Malfeasance is quite potent when it comes to total damage, but Lucky Pants losing its holster functionality, the time spent firing 15 or more shots exceeding rocket loader periods, and the loss of a better damage exotic all hinder Malfeasance from being a default rotation option, although it does have some niche use as we'll see later. Osteostriga is functionally similar to Wither Horde, in fact doing even more damage overall when comparing a Wither Horde shot versus a Striga mag, but requires far too much time applying poison for it to be worth using in a rotation. All other exotic primaries, namely Final Warning, Devil's Ruin, Touch of Malice, Hierarchy of Needs, Outbreak Perfected, and others, simply do not do enough raw damage and or require an overcommitment to their gameplay loop that results in lower overall DPS when compared to even just pure rocket spam. Merciless suffers from the same problem Malfeasance does. It does a good amount of damage, but it only really makes sense to use Merciless after you run out of rockets, not while you use rockets, since it requires a huge overcommitment into getting impetus kills and then waiting out the charge time of 8 fusion shots to fully utilize its exotic effect. Lord of Wolves just doesn't do enough damage, 129,000 for an entire release the Wolves mag. You might be asking where these damage numbers come from. I'll be going over how I test damage effectively in the final chapter of this series, but know that I test using Templar, a raid boss with no problematic multipliers or modifiers, and I use a 2016 Toyota Corolla's health bar measuring damage tracker tool in order to produce the most accurate results possible. There are actually quite a few damage sources in Destiny that do significantly more damage to a boss than display or wipe screen numbers would suggest, and I'll go over the most interesting examples in that video. Finally, let's go over the legendary special options. Traditionally, the highest fire rate frames have been the ones to look out for, and with the clock ticking as we await our rocket reload, that makes the most sense, as these weapons also tend to have the highest burst DPS in exchange for having lower total damage. Looking at the game's current specials, we have rapid fire fusions, rapid fire shotguns, rapid fire snipers, lightweight grenade launchers, trace rifles, and glaives. Trace rifles and glaives we can immediately eliminate, their role is clearly not boss DPS. Rapid Fire Fusions are an alright contender, but examining their damage profile, they actually do less damage per shot than Slug Shotguns, while having the disadvantage of charge time, a huge mark against them in a rotation favoring single shot, non-committal weapons. The same can be said for High Impact Fusions. While they do have higher DPS than Rapid Fire Fusions thanks to their recent buff, their lengthy charge time is simply not worth waiting through for the amount of damage they deal. Speaking of shotguns, rapid fire shotguns are alright, but they do about 25% less damage per shot than slugs, and while they do fire nearly twice as fast, they are less suitable for swapping due to their double shot requirement as well as their already high fire rate. The reason why slugs are generally the best swap shotgun archetype is because they do the highest damage per shot, outside of aggressives which have awful handling and the worst firing delay, have generally high handling, and can bypass their firing delay by shooting another weapon while on cooldown. This idea was the basis of double slug swapping in year 4, where players would essentially double the already high DPS of the slug shotgun archetype by shooting slugs at double their normal rate. Next up we have snipers. Legendary snipers are a bit of a rarity when it comes to optimal damage, given that they trade a fair amount of damage, losing 30% per shot when comparing rapid fire snipers and shotguns, for a huge range advantage which typically isn't useful in most damage scenarios in Destiny. That said, there are some scenarios where a boss is so far away that the default slug shotguns isn't an option. For scenarios like these, players tend to pick and choose between either firing two rapid fire sniper shots or a grenade launcher shot, both of which do nearly the same amount of damage, around 28k when comparing Irukandji and Wilderflight. And yes, not to give things away too early, but Wilderflight is far and away the best swap GL in the game thanks to its frame giving it a free 30% edge over lightweights, so if you're going to pick a GL, that would be the one to go for. 
When I designed the rotations for this video, I took into account a number of factors. First, I wanted to test a diverse set of options in order to make sure that everyone watching would have good reference points to help them understand just how good or bad a damage strategy is. So, I went to task picking from three groups of strategies. First, simple options used in LFG or referenced in damage discussions, like Thunderlord. Second, more complex rotations that more advanced players might use in speedruns, lowmans, or other challenges, like Bane Switch Cataclysmic. And third, new rotations of my own design that are focused on maximizing burst damage using what I know and have learned from my damage testing, like Malfeasance Rocket. Before we get started, take some time to poke around my boss damage spreadsheet, which contains the results of nearly 7 full days of damage testing, spanning 183GB of video data, nearly 200 different health bar tests, 83 different damage components, and 34 different rotations. All of these damage rotations were tested accounting for almost everything, including damage supers like Blade Barrage, abilities like Verity's Brow Fusion Grenades, and exotic armor like Reign of Fire. Basically, if you were an optimal player using these damage strategies in a raid, this is what you'd do. That means, for example, that most damage rotations involve a Hunter starting with a Feast of Light Blade Barrage, and then swapping mid-animation to a more weapon-focused exotic. Keep in mind that this actually brings all the options in this list closer together, making the bad rotations appear to do higher DPS because they're front-loaded by the best damage super in the game, and leaving the good rotations mostly the same since they were doing close to that DPS anyways. You'll also notice a distinct lack of Titan on this list. Unfortunately, Titans don't bring much to the table in terms of DPS at this time. While Warlocks have Reign of Fire and the best swap DPS subclass in Broodweaver, and Hunters have access to the highest DPS super in the game in Star Eater Scales Boosted Blade Barrage, and the best reload exotic in Radiant Dance Machines, Titans have a good damage super in Curious Boosted Thunder Crash, strong abilities in Heart of Inmost Light Boosted Touch of Thunder Pulse and Storm Grenades, but no helpful weapon DPS exotic outside of Actium War Rig. Essentially, there isn't really a standard situation where it makes sense to take a Titan over the other two classes for damage reasons. That isn't to say Titans can't do good damage, but for the purposes of my spreadsheet, none of the rotations would do the highest DPS with a Titan performing them. If you're interested in seeing an isolated component when it comes to damage rotations, that information is also available in the Components tab of the spreadsheet. Each and every damage rotation was measured input to input per action using a frame timer overlay on a 60fps recording, taking the best case scenario of player swapping with the best mods and appropriate exotic in use. Additionally, each and every damage element was calculated and accounted for individually, with each shot of every weapon given its own row in the spreadsheet outside of machine guns. For every rotation, the assumed buff and debuff were Radiant and Tractor Cannon at 25% and 30% respectively, and the optimal surges, perks, and mods including reserves were chosen for the weapons at hand. Technically, I could modify the results to account for Lumina, but Well is just so omnipresent that it just makes sense to use that as the default buff instead. Plus, it wouldn't really change the results comparatively to bump the buff column to 35%. Finally, I tried my best to keep every damage rotation relatively flat and consistent. What this means is that if there is a point in the rotation where DPS would fall off a cliff if you continued trying to dump ammo, I just ended the rotation there. For example, when doing Izanagi's burden swaps with a grenade launcher and a rocket, once you're out of Izzy and rocket ammo, it doesn't really make sense to include the dumping of 15 Wilderflight ammo in a row into the boss as part of the rotation if we're being realistic. While these rotations will certainly not be perfect for every boss in the game, hopefully they will serve to help show how powerful damage rotations can be in Destiny 2. While the filler options in these rotations can be flexible and adaptable depending on the boss being dealt with, the shared fundamental understanding that players can gain from understanding how and why damage rotations are formed will allow for a more complete and successful endgame Destiny 2 experience. On top of this, in the next video, we'll be going over the optimal strategy for each and every raid and dungeon boss in the game, so if I've missed anything in this video, you'll be sure to see any quirky boss-specific damage strategies in part 6. The furthest we're gonna go in this video is death throws or multi-dodge refreshing mid-damage, which is possible in most boss environments. That means no surrounded strats, no sky parasites, or anything like that. With that long preamble out of the way, let's talk results. Sorted from lowest to highest DPS, I'll briefly describe how each rotation was tested and calculated, as well as go over the rotation's viability in today's meta. Starting with the worst of the options tested, Enhanced Target Lock Retrofit Escapade is one of the most well-known damage options to LFGs and casual players alike, thanks to its pre-nerf volatile round stint during Season of the Seraph. Since those days, Retrofit has maintained a reputation of being an excellent total damage weapon with massive reserves, but how well does it hold up DPS-wise? The answer is… not great. Even though this rotation assists Retrofit by starting with a Star Eater Scales boosted Mobius Quiver and then swapping to Jerfalcon's Hauberk, on top of using Mobius Quiver every 2 mags thanks to the massive super generation from machine gun hits, 
this thing still hits like a pool noodle. The only merit Retrofit has is doing around 8.5 million total damage, close to double most of the other options on this list, but the fact that it takes nearly 2 minutes to do so is pretty much unacceptable for any damage scenario in present day Destiny. On top of this, it would be incredibly easy to extend Malfeasance Rocket or any of the grenade based rotations in this list to do the same total damage or more with much higher DPS to boot. However, like I mentioned earlier, this list is primarily about maximizing the damage any given rotation can do, and I cut short any rotations that would have to compromise DPS for total damage. As a side note, if you're curious about how pre-nerf retrofit sizes up to the competition, I'm planning on implementing a historical tab in my DPS spreadsheet that compares pre-patch versions of popular damage options from different eras of Destiny with today's DPS options. If that's something you're interested in seeing, I'll describe it in further detail in the final part of this video series, so feel free to leave me some ideas. Not much to say about this one, the starter scales blade barrage swap into the 6 coyote for reload dodges and then 3 full mag dumps yields dps that is mediocre at best. Tested this one by popular request and it landed about where I expected. To be clear, while I may have put a lot of these weapons and strategies on blast, none of them are unusable. Of course there are plenty of damage options that are significantly worse than these, I limited my testing pool to options that the community at large either knows or believes to be at least decent for damage. That being said, there's not much good I can say about Air Apparent. Even for how easy it is to use, there are exotics that are just as easy to use, do higher DPS, and have similar total damage output. Thunderlord is kind of in the same boat as Air Apparent, except it's got a dinghy instead of a life raft. Ever since the fixing of its double lightning strike interaction with Divinity's crit, it's clear that this exotic is a rather mediocre one for boss damage, though it does do higher DPS on top of having higher total damage compared to its arc shielded neighbor on the damage ranking list. This is yet another exotic I'll be adding to the historical tab so that people can compare its pre-nerf damage to existing options, but in its current state, Thunderlord is a bottom of the barrel damage strategy when it comes to endgame scenarios. Next up, we have Taipan 4FR, the craftable void equivalent of Reed's Regret. Remember when triple tab firing line Reed's Regret was everyone's favorite damage option? Even if Linears hadn't been nerfed, Taipan would still be a huge distance behind the top options on this list, and even those that would argue for total damage when it comes to Linears will struggle to defend them in the state they are in today. To provide some more detail, this rotation actually adds a honed Izanagi shot right before beginning to spam Linear ammo, and it also accounts for the fact that enhanced triple tap and a reload dodge after emptying the second mag will allow for a third triple tap proc in the third mag, boosting the total effective reserves to 34. Like I said, these rotations are what an optimal player would do if given these options. Unfortunately, still not enough to save Taipan from taking the 4th lowest spot on the rotations ranking. Coming up on our first traditional rotation, we have Double Pellet Tractor with Reign of Fire. For those unfamiliar, this is just like a Double Slug Tractor rotation, but with pellet shotguns used in order to damage bosses like Oryx, where the crit is out of reach for a slug shotgun. While I knew this rotation was most definitely going to do less damage than a hunter doing the same thing, this was a useful test to compare the total damage added by using Reign of Fire to reload all three shotguns compared to having a blade barrage up front and only getting one reload of each shotgun through the dragon's shadow. For reference, the rotation is simply cycling through all three shotguns until all three have exhausted their mags, which are 7 shots, then dashing and doing it all over again until all three are out of ammo. If you want to see the details on damage calculations including shot timings for this rotation or any others, check out the rotations tab in the spreadsheet for more info on exactly how I arrived at my damage numbers. For pellet shotgun options, as I've discussed in my other videos, any lightweight with Vorpal is appropriate with preference towards Reese Walker and without remorse. Another infamous linear from the Witch Queen era is Cataclysmic. Boasting the highest total damage of any linear at nearly 5.5 million, this rotation abuses Force Times a Charm and Bait and Switch, the best ammo regen perk and one of the best consistent damage perks in the game. Unfortunately, Cataclysmic just isn't up to snuff when it comes to raw DPS, just barely breaching 6 digits. Much like Taipan, this rotation accounts for the fact that you can actually shoot 12 shots per mag past mag 1. Since the last 2 shots in a mag count towards 4 times a charm on the next mag if you shoot the first 2 in the next mag quickly enough. This means that Izanagi's Burden is out of the question, since it takes far too long to hone if we want to stay within the 3 second FTTC window. This little quirk allows us to reach an effective 43 total ammo from a mere 23 start, since we're essentially shooting non-stop from the FTTC calculation perspective. Many players grew fond of how good Cataclysmic was during year 5, but its placement this far down in the DPS ranking should let you know just how far we've come since its days of glory, even if the Lightfall Linear nerf had never happened. For some of you, this may make you even reassess the Rocket versus Linear debate many were having at the time. As you'll see in the rest of the list, Rockets were leagues ahead of Linear even back then. 
The concept with this rotation is the same as double pellet tractor with Vorpal shotguns once again, except the rotation is modified to account for the different mag sizes of Fortissimo, 5 with assault mag, and Nessa, 12 with reconstruction. To sum it up, the rotation goes through 6 Nessa and 5 Fortissimo shots every cycle, starting and ending with Nessa before swapping back the tractor and then dashing. On top of that, instead of using all three shotguns equally, since slugs have higher damage per shot than Tractor, a lightweight based shotgun, the rotation focuses more on the slugs, only involving Tractor to keep the scientific method uptime and the boss debuffed. Sleeper's pretty straightforward. Most players are at least aware of Sleeper's existence as a decent damage option, and given that it outdoes more popular damage exotics like Thunderlord, it's not a horrible pick either. There are a couple exotics above it that I'd personally say are better low effort damage options, but it's an easy to understand anchor point that we can use to compare other rotations to 2 times more DPS than Sleeper or something like that. A little lacking in the total damage department, but that shouldn't really be surprising to anyone. Xenophage actually ended up placing a little higher than I expected, higher than Sleeper, but still suffers from its low total damage. Nothing too crazy in the rotation, just a swap to Radiant Dance Machines and using your second dodge right when multi-dodge is about to expire after 21 shots. I feel like a broken record talking about easy to use solar exotics that shoot at a consistent rate as this is the third one in a row, but maybe it's not a coincidence. Anyways, with Whisper breathing active, Whisper has decent total damage and decent DPS, but nothing worth writing home about, much like everything that came before it. Another benchmark to measure stuff with though. If you're on the linear train, this is the last stop. Briar's Contempt is as good as linears get when it comes to DPS. A little saddening given that we're not even a third of the way up the list, but let's talk about what Briar's has going for it. The better of the two linear frames for DPS, one of the best damage perks in the game in Enhanced Surrounded, and Enhanced Rewind Rounds, giving the gun the opportunity to go through its entire reserves with only one reload. When the topic comes up, I tell people linears didn't need a nerf at the start of Lightfall. In fact, they probably needed a buff if rockets weren't and aren't getting nerfed. And now, hopefully, it becomes clear why. Not only do linears do under half the DPS of optimized rocket rotations, but they also don't even have legitimate claims to total damage either, given just how much effective damage rockets do. Not to beat linears while they're down, but the fact that a damage rotation that intentionally sacrifices power weapon damage to provide a debuff for the rest of the team is out damaging their best candidate is truly indicative of how behind they are in today's meta. This rotation in particular is the same thing as the Warlock version, just with a blade barrage tacked in front instead. On top of that, you only get one chance to reload all your weapons, so there's only two mags being dumped instead of all the reserves. That being said, the total damage still ends up around the same, so the only time a rain of fire rotation would be better is in environments where your debuff player has to be a Warlock. Same deal as the Warlock version, but with two reconstruction slugs instead of one, since hunters don't have the luxury of Reign of Fire. This way, the rotation can actually dump 18 of each slug instead of stopping at 10 or 12, like with Fortissimo. With a Recombination Heritage and a Vorpal Nessa, this rotation ends up only slightly edging out Double Pellet Tractor, which is a useful tidbit for more experienced players looking to compare pellets and slugs. They're not so different after all. The rotation order for this one is Tractor, 6 of each slug, Tractor, 6 of each slug, Dodge, Tractor, 6 of each slug again, and then a Tractor shot to finish up. With Enhanced Explosive Light being capped at 7 of the 19 total shots that Regnant holds, this rotation is severely disadvantaged as it progresses past the first two Regnant mags. While a more consistent damage perk would lift this rotation a little higher, it wouldn't be anywhere near enough to bring HGLs up into meta contention, especially given that there aren't really any special selling points that HGLs have to offer. For this rotation, the order is 3 Regnant, Wilder Flight, then Izanagi on loop until you run out of Regnant ammo. Make sure you hone before rallying for this one since you'll be using 6 honed edge shots. If you're a Gallahorn user and you want to do more damage than just spamming Galley, this is generally the best option for you, offering around 10-15% to more DPS while boosting your total damage by around 160%. Sporting a Vorpal Fortissimo and a Frenzy Sojourners, this rotation is pretty straightforward. Start with a Galley shot, then alternate between your slugs for 2 shots each, then repeat. Once you've shot 2 rockets and 8 slugs, simply dash and start over until you end on your 10th Galley shot. Another test by popular request, Two-Tailed Fox is alright when it comes to damage amongst the top 3 exotic power weapon only rotations. Small note though, going forward, a fair portion of the damage rotations will assume that you are able to refresh the multi-dodge timer on Radiant Dance Machines while doing damage. While this isn't particularly hard, one grenade or knife will do the trick, be aware that Two-Tailed Fox will not accomplish anywhere near this much DPS with manual reloads. This rotation simulates the best possible scenario, a player blade barraging a boss, swapping from SES to RDM's midair, and then shooting 10 TTF rockets in a row while refreshing multi-dodge in the middle of damage at some point. Merciless has recently gained some notoriety, especially in the low manning community where it was used in the world's first solo Nezarek as a burst option during final stand. Analyzing its numbers, it's no surprise it's as effective as it is. For a special only rotation, 2.5 million total damage while maintaining decent DPS is certainly outstanding. 
While you're certainly not going to be using Merciless as your main damage source anytime soon, it's an excellent use of energy special ammo when you're out of rockets and meshes incredibly well with Radiant Dance Machines, given that you need to get a kill for impetus anyways. Speaking of which, this rotation was specifically designed around RDMs, to make the most use of impetus. First, get a kill with Merciless, dodge reload, shoot 7, use your 8th on an add, dodge, shoot 7, kill an add again, dodge, and dump the rest of your ammo. Pretty simple, but using RDMs to dodge reload actually noticeably increases the DPS of Merciless compared to manual reloads. Just above Two-Tailed Fox, Leviathan's Breath is another exotic that pans out as a decent DPS option if you're only going for the exotic heavy route. It's easy to use, works on almost any boss, can be used by any number of people in the fire team. Honestly, now that I'm looking at a lot of these damage exotics, they kind of just blend together. At least this one's good against champs. And that reminds me, frame-based damage, including the double damage glitch with this weapon along with tick sources like storm grenades, will be tested at some point in the future too. Finally, we arrive at the last of the three exotics I'll recommend to people who want an extremely simple damage option. Acarius is pretty decent if a boss is close range, and with Trench Barrel, it has greater total damage than almost anything that comes below it in the DPS ranking. Having recently gained a lot of popularity on dungeon bosses over former fan favorite The Lament, which clocks in at around 25% less DPS, Legend of Acarius is definitely a safe choice for consistent damage against melee viable bosses. As one of the last single weapon focused damage strategies on the list, Deathbringer marks a special spot. First, a disclaimer, and one that you've probably heard before, if you use this weapon, you will almost definitely not get the damage numbers you see here, as these results assume perfect reload timing with RDMs, multi-dodge refreshing while shooting, and maximum height on every projectile. On top of that, most people know that Deathbringer seems to have an instance projectile limit, where multiple people shooting it will simply delete some of the projectiles, making it a non-starter for boss damage in general. Deathbringer used to be a chart topper when it came to theoretical single weapon DPS charts, and that trend doesn't seem to be changing much when it comes to more extended damage options. This next rotation marks a big divide between the bottom and top half of the rotation ranking. First, not only is there a huge leap in DPS coming up between this rotation and the next, but almost every single rotation from here on out is a rotation in the classic sense, involving swapping of weapons, part of the second and third design categories that I mentioned before. Someone asked me to test Malfeasance with Lucky Pants, and I wanted to see if I could fit it in an actual damage rotation, and fit it did. While this isn't anywhere near the highest damage rotation on the list, it's certainly interesting to see Malfeasance being used effectively in a damage rotation. It does require a bit of finesse, one part of the rotation requires players to kill an enemy with a lightweight knife, to load a Grave Robber Vorpal Weapon Aikilos SG and activate Ember of Singeing for a second reload dodge, however it does bring some very high total damage to the table, especially given how high its DPS manages to be. Dumping horseman ammo into an enemy has always been a trademark of endgame damage strategies, especially in speedrunning. While this isn't really a traditional rotation, in case you were wondering how much DPS 4 straight horseman mags ends up doing, this is it. With damage like this, it's no surprise that DreamWork boosted 20 mag horsemen were melting boss during the 2022 solstice, especially given that every shot past 5 had max broadside stacks. Ah yes, the Dragon's Shadow triple rocket rotation. Originally shared to the community by Blazing S Fire and Achilles, this rotation allows hunters to shoot three rockets in a row by exploiting the fact that the Dragon's Shadow dodge reload animation actually shifts the reload itself to the end of the dodge animation, rather than the start. Thanks to this quirk, players can shoot, manual reload, and shoot while dodging at the end of the manual reload. By doing this, the rocket finishes loading during your dodge, and a rocket seemingly pops out of your dodging body, and you can shoot another one as your dodge ends thanks to the delayed Dragon's reload. Besides that, everything else about this rotation is pretty standard. Izzy, 2 snipe, rocket, and repeat. Throw in an Ember of Singeing lightweight knife in there and you're golden for another dodge. While this rotation has been overshadowed, it's still a solid pick and a bit of year 4 nostalgia for endgame players. This rotation, minus the fact that it doesn't involve bipod, is about as spammy as it gets. Get this, you're shooting 10 rockets and then 20 horsemen in a row without any interruptions besides reload dodging, provided you can keep multi-dodge up. I don't think another multi-weapon rotation on this list gets better value out of a triple surge than this one. Remember how I mentioned bipod? Yeah, so this rotation shoots not 10, but 15 rockets in a row at bipod buffed rates. On top of that, we're taking 15 envious assassin stacks into the start of the rotation, meaning we start off with 5 rockets without a single reload. Unfortunately, bipod rockets buffed with pack hunter currently do about 48% of the true damage of a bait and switch equivalent. And this is such a huge offset that the increased fire rate and spam factor of this rotation isn't enough to overcome it. While we are taking advantage of the stackable 15% stasis weapon boost from Balladorus Wrathweavers, Bipod holds this rotation back enough that it still doesn't surpass bait and switch apex spam, which we'll see higher up in this ranking. When Bipod gets buffed in the coming seasons, definitely keep an eye out for how this one moves. 
A few of you might recognize this rotation from Warlock Solo Nezarek and other challenges taken on by D2 players at the start of Lightfall. While Starfire has since been nerfed, I simulated what a pre-nerf Starfire rotation would be like on a boss by having a teammate provide me with Field of Flame, the Verity's brow buff that boosts teammate grenade regeneration. Ever since Starfire was heralded as the best thing since sliced bread for boss DPS, one of my goals with making a video like this became explaining how Starfire wasn't actually broken for boss DPS, but for other reasons. I'll probably explain my thoughts on Starfire in a video related to analyzing armor exotics, but the point is this. Starfire is much like Malfeasance in that they aren't extremely high DPS options when used in rotations. Instead, they are infinitely refreshable filler, which is a useful role in its own right. If you ever need to spread out your rocket use more, but something like Izanagi's Burden or the Fourth Horseman would be too quick of an ammo dump, Starfire Fusion Grenades, much like Malfeasance Mags, are fantastic for extending your total damage in time to empty. I used to tell people that Starfire doesn't increase DPS, you actually tend to lose damage by taking the time to throw fusion grenades that do 100k damage when your rockets do 400k or more. What Starfire actually does to a rotation is flatten it out by adding slight dips in your DPS in exchange for using less ammo. It took Bungie nerfing Starfire for a lot of people to detach themselves from its quilty shell, and thankfully it opened the door for people to explore a few of the rotations to come that were already in the game before Starfire's nerf people. That being said, this rotation is still designed to do the highest DPS while still using Starfire Fusions to reload a demo rocket, so there is no intentional flattening going on here. It's as simple as Wither Horde, Slug, then a cycle of Rocket Nade, Rocket Manual Reload, only breaking to refresh bait and switch after the 6th rocket. Wait a second, didn't we just do Wither Horde Nade Rocket? Ah, but this rotation's a little different. Not only are you juggling your bait and switch timer, but if you still want to do a grenade rotation, Starfire isn't really an option in most cases anymore. In its place, we have Verity's Brow, which is a much more involved damage rotation that requires getting a stack refresh using a solar weapon at least every 10 seconds in exchange for doubling your fusion grenade damage. Naturally, this rotation is only appropriate on some bosses, and also loses some damage by interrupting rocket spam with time for getting stacks. However, you can see that the DPS ends up being slightly higher on top of doing more total damage. Since this rotation is a bit situational, we'll talk about what bosses a rotation like this might be appropriate for in the next video. As our first Needlestorm rotation on the list, we have Izanagi Slug Apex. This rotation is a twist on the classic Izzy rocket swap with Thread of Ascent being used in the mix as often as possible to squeeze extra rockets out as often as possible. This slug can be swapped out for a uh, Wilder Flight or a Sniper for longer range bosses, and the DPS shouldn't change too much. Additionally, if consistent Threadling Grenade uptime is an issue, it can be swapped out for Grapple at minimal DPS loss. While the second half of this rotation is pretty standard, Izzy Slug Rocket Nade Rocket, the first half is a little too specific for me to list it all out here, so if you want more details, look at the rotation tab of the spreadsheet for the specific order of actions. This next rotation combines two popular burst options with a loadout swap. Instead of just including Grand Overture or Parasite by themselves in this list, which would be extremely low total damage and wouldn't really constitute a rotation, I decided to chain Grand Overture, Blade Barrage, and Fourth Horseman spam together, Speaking of Parasite, it's missing because it doesn't really have much use in the standard damage scenarios and it's not particularly noteworthy if you try to do so. There are still some specific instances where it's a good idea, but we'll save those for the next video. As for this rotation, it's got only 3 parts, shoot a 20 missile overture volley, cast blade barrage, swap to RDM's mid cast, and then land and shoot 3 mags of horsemen. When Conditional Finality released and people were ranting and raving about how it was the best raid exotic to come out in a while, I started to wonder whether it could be used in damage rotations. After doing some health bar testing on a lot of the exotics in the game, it didn't look too promising, especially given its aggressive frame, reduced damage in team settings because of shared ignition and shatter procs, and of course its lack of automatic reload. However, I also discovered a few other things through my testing. 1. Conditional Finality is at worst equivalent to another aggressive frame shotgun when swapping, and at best, one that does around double damage. 2. Aggressive frame shotgun swapping isn't bad, it's almost on par with lightweight swapping given equal perks, even if it might feel sluggish. And 3. This rotation actually does enough weapon damage that sacrificing Needlestorm for Reign of Fire, something that can reload Conditional, the other shotgun, and your rocket, is actually worth doing. Plus, this rotation is pretty easy to pull off. 4 shotgun, rocket dash rocket on repeat, taking advantage of reconstruction at the start. Even if multiple people are doing this rotation, the DPS is actually still competitive enough that the damage loss of losing ignitions and shatters isn't a big deal. But you should probably have at most one person doing this, especially given the existence of the next rotation. Double Slug Rocket, another classic. If you saw the Double Slug Galahorn rotation, this is pretty much the same thing with Thread of Ascent instead of Rain of Fire, and Five Slug instead of Four. First half is the same as Izzy Slug Apex 2. So a disclaimer here, while this rotation might be in the top 3, and it's also the highest DPS rotation that doesn't involve just dumping bait and switch rockets abusing radiant dance machines, 
This is probably not an appropriate rotation for most circumstances. First of all, it does almost equal DPS to Double Slug Apex, but is mechanically much more difficult to pull off given how tight I've set all the input timings. Additionally, sliding into your teammates during rocket damage, even if you're coordinated, is probably not the best idea. It's still pretty cool to see 7 slideways and ascent rockets dumped in a row though. Well, if you know anything about the Iranian Dance Machine's changes, you probably saw this one coming. The ability to dump an entire rocket's reserves with a mere 1.3 or so seconds between each rocket, not even accounting for envious or reconstruction, is absolutely insane, and boy does it show up in these results. The only real difference between this rotation and the next one is the rocket of choice, and we'll go over why that matters in a second. Atop this mountain of 34 damage rotations lies Cold Comfort, this time not with Bipod. Some of you might be confused, why does this rotation have over 40k more DPS than the same thing with Apex Predator instead? First, Cold Comfort can take advantage of Balador's Wrath Reaver's stasis weapon boost, so that's a free 15% on top. Second, Envious Assassin and Restoration Ritual are better than Reconstruction for a rocket spam rotation, since you can shoot 4 rockets in a row instead of 2. Finally, as an aggressive frame rocket, Cold Comfort's firing delay is only 1.1 seconds, whereas Apex Predator's adaptive frame limits it to 1.183 seconds, which makes a small but quantifiable difference in their DPS for the first few rockets, especially that given Cold Comfort is shooting 4 of them in a row. Now that I filled your brain with 34 damage rotations, let's talk about which ones I think actually make sense as default choices for most bosses. While some of the precise values listed above may change over time as I retest options like rockets more and more thoroughly, these suggestions should still be valid for the current meta. For the Titan player's sakes, I'll also briefly explain how these rotations can be adapted to Titans as well. Standard, Izanagi Slug Apex and Double Slug Apex. These two rotations are pretty similar, with one being more appropriate for longer range bosses with the right filler weapon slotted in. The Warlock rotation is already written in, and Hunters would do the same thing except start with RDM spamming 5 rockets before going back to using Izanagi. For Titans, there's no stowed reload assist, so you'd be opening with a Curious Thunder Crash and then just do regular Izzy filler rocket swaps. Effort, RDM dump. If you're a Hunter and you want to put an effort to do the most damage, this is the play for you. You're going to need to learn how and when to kill an add after you start multi-dodge, but when the boss environment calls for it, this rotation is incredibly high damage no matter what kind of damage phase you're dealing with. Exotic, Legend of Acrius or Leviathan's Breath. Two options for two different ranges. I've already said all I really want to about this pair in the results section, so these two picks should be fairly obvious. Just front load with your class's best damage super, Needlestorm, Blade Barrage, or T-Crash, and get to pumping. Other, Tractor and Gallarhorn. Since almost every modern damage strategy in Destiny 2 requires a Tractor or a debuff player and someone on Gallarhorn, I had to include something for all the debuffers and pack leaders out there. Double Slug or Pellet is typically the way to go in these uh, cases, and they're the only choices listed here anyways. For long-ranged or other unique instances requiring either of these components, like Daughters or Golgoroth, Part 6 should contain any exceptional cases that don't fit shotguns. Learning how to perform damage rotations can be daunting for a lot of newer players, and there's often a stigma against learning how to do damage rotations in general. People seem to think that damage rotations are mechanically difficult or sweaty, when in reality, I can tell you that those that learn and understand how to use them only stand to gain a fun experience in Destiny that they would not have gotten otherwise. First, damage rotations are not particularly difficult. Like anything else in this game, they take practice and familiarity, but they almost never require some frame-perfect input timing or vast knowledge and tracking of cooldowns. Second, damage rotations are also a sliding scale. You can pace yourself and learn something simpler before you want to approach something more complicated involving more moving parts. Finally, there's nothing wrong with learning to love doing more damage, especially in an MMO-style game, and damage rotations will help you get there if that's where you want to go. If I haven't lost you yet, there are a handful of tips that you learn over time using a variety of damage strategies that I've compiled here in order to make your life easier. They are as follows. Number 1. Boost your handling as much as you can using dexterity mods, targeting mods, effects like on your mark, and exotics like Ophidian Aspect where applicable. One of the most common mistakes I see newer players make when learning damage rotations is having low handling weapons or inadequate mods, which makes their swaps look so sluggish that it is actually detrimental to their learning process. I get asked how I get my swaps so fast a lot. I cheat using dexterity, targeting, and handling mods. Try it, it's like crack for swapping. Number 2. Use your number row keys to switch weapons if you typically use your scroll wheel, especially for rotations like double slug. Number 3. Take your time to aim your precision shots. Think Izanagi and Slug and Sniper, and when you become more comfortable, speed up your rotation. For weapons where you need to ADS to shoot accurately, make sure your crosshair is somewhere near the target before you ADS so you don't need to do as much micro-adjustment. Number 4. Practicing in the Enclave or in similar locations is fine, but practicing on a real boss is always going to be better. A lot of people practice damage fine by themselves, but their damage really suffers in real damage environments. Number 5. With Izanagi's Burden, hold R before you start shooting the gun to get an instant hone afterwards. 
The same also applies for other weapons that you might manually reload. Pressing R as soon as your shot goes out allows you to reload faster than if you try to continue shooting normally. Number 6. Try not to ADS with any weapon that doesn't need it, like rockets, GLs, or pellet shotguns. Number 7. Remember you can sprint while holding a weapon to instant ready it after a state change. This is especially useful for Izanagi's burden right after you hone it. Number 8. Use sound cues to learn when your rocket or other auto-loading weapons have loaded. Number 9. Make sure you are close enough to the boss to apply Tracker Cannon's debuff if you are using it, because there is a small range window where a boss may glow purple from being damaged by Tractor, but will not be debuffed. Number 10. Abuse full auto fire to shoot your weapons as early as possible when swapping to them. Number 11. Learn ready and stow animation cancelling using grenades and rain of fire in order to maximize swap speed. Number 12. Use the magazine counter to tell you when you can swap off weapons like Izanagi's Burden or to know when a weapon is actually done reloading, even though its reload animation may not be complete. That was a bit of a lengthy video, but I got a lot of requests to do a lot of testing, and this is the first of the big three when it comes to DPS videos, the other two being part 6 and 7. I hope the ride was at least partially enjoyable to watch, and hopefully the next two parts of this series will release in a shorter time period than this one did. If you have anything you want to see tested or verified in the spreadsheet, feel free to leave a comment, and of course, thanks to everyone who helped with beating up Templar over the past week, including people from my Twitch chat and Discord server. As usual, all clips used in the video that don't belong to me are linked in the description, as well as the quantum damage spreadsheet, which contains a lot of base values that I reference in the video. Damage rotations are one of the most fun parts of learning to become a more competent endgame player in Destiny 2, and through this video, I hope I was able to create and explain a resource that actually addresses two concerns I had with the current state of damage testing. First, other tests in the past have used wipe screen numbers instead of health bar values, which are sometimes extremely inaccurate as we will explore in part 7. Second, very few content creators cover proper damage rotations, and when they do, the testing isn't comprehensive enough to provide firm conclusions. I wanted to work on this project until I felt that in my heart, I was confident about the data I was presenting and drawing conclusions from, and as far as I can tell, I'm pretty happy with what we've got here. Next video, we're going to talk about every single raid and dungeon boss in the game, and discuss why people might use damage strategies that are or aren't on the damage ranking. In the meantime, get to cooking some bosses!